Hey everybody, welcome to the Outer Procurement Podcast. I'm Philip Eidson, and um, I'm joined in our This Month in Procurement format, which is today's episode, as ever by Kerry Barner. Kerry is the owner and managing director of Buyer's Meeting Point and also the general manager here at Outer Procurement. Kerry, great to catch up and thanks for joining me again. Absolutely, Phil, and thanks so much, everybody, for joining us. Yeah, and a quick just review of the format for this month in procurement. So, first of all, we'll just have a brief discussion on the pods that we have had over the past month. You know, that's a good way for us to provide a little bit of color and context and some thoughts that maybe I don't get the opportunity to share in the podcast, but also a good way for you to catch up as well if there's things that you may have missed over the last few weeks. Um, we then go into a particular topic of interest that's been on our mind, um, and then we'll just wrap up with what's coming up next month. So, let's jump straight into it, Kelly, with um, the pods that we've had this month. And the first one we had was with Joe Yakura, and it was on data quality. Uh, Joe is a former CPO, companies like American Express, IHG, um, Fannie Mae, and we're really talking about the importance of data to procurement. Uh, what were some of the things that you took from that uh, episode, Kelly? So it, it was kind of interesting because I took sort of like a, a good news, bad news from Joe, but really it's all good news. I mean, the the bad news, I suppose, if you look at it in a traditional way, is that the current state of both our data quality and enterprise decision maker trust of that data mm-hmm. is horrible. Yeah. Everyone thinks the data is terrible. Nobody trusts it. The more traditional good news is that it's the same for everybody. I mean, there's probably... I mean, 1%, half of 1%, mm. practically no one's company is actually in a good position with regard to data, which makes the fact that the data is terrible and no one trusts it good news because it means it's a problem we can be honest about and can address in the open. Yeah, I think it's one then that is a, it's one of those challenges that we we can approach collectively as a profession, if that makes sense. So because we're all at that same kind of point in maturity, um, it's, it's kind of like an industry wide problem. So yes. that means that we can, I think there's, there's such an importance on how do we solve for it that we're seeing kind of the entire community rally around that challenge, both from a technology perspective, you know, emerging tech platforms who are doing a great job of kind of cleansing and pulling together data into a single source of truth to, um, really, you know, sh- the sharing of best practices around what people have done to start getting a control of that problem. Because even those organizations that, that feel they're a little bit more advanced in how they manage their data and the quality of their data from a procurement perspective, if they were to honestly look themselves in the mirror, would probably say, you know what, it's still not great. It's just better than it used to be. And and it's funny because listening to Joe, it's as scary a problem as it is when you really break it down to its core elements, it becomes far less intimidating. And he talks about some very simple things that I think make the problem that much easier to get your arms around. One is that he talks about the fact that in most cases, data is terrible because no one person or team owns it, mm-hmm. right? And so for procurement teams that have the resources, have the skills, and are maybe looking for an actionable way to elevate themselves or gain some more influence internally, step up and say, right, we'll take it. We'll address this. Everyone has to do their part, but we're willing to play a leading ownership role in it. Um, and And the other one is the idea that Although data is being created at an alarming rate and the quality problem is obviously connected to the way in which we create it and store it, data also expires. And so some of the data is kind of falling off the back all the time. So we're never going to be faced with the situation where we have to fix all of the data going back to, you know, the stone ages and everything that's more current and everything that's being created, you know, one second at a time. It, it is a defined problem. We just have to sort of set that scope for ourselves um, so we don't have a breakdown when we're thinking about having to fix this enormous problem. I think that's a really, really important point, you know, because it seems un- unsurmountable when you think about, oh, gosh, think about all that data that exists and how do I get my arms around it and all the, the historical data is bad data and do I need to cleanse it? Um, you know, and there's huge armies of people that are often put on projects to do that cleansing. But, you know, the fact that, as he said, and you mentioned there, data gets old really quickly. And so you could actually, you know, if you start putting in place new processes, um, you know, he talked about, um, 
was that data dictionary for so you yes, can define right. data if you put those practices in today you don't really even need to be backward looking because in six to 12 months you're going to have all the data that you need um that is actually that's come together under kind of your new processes procedures uh, definitions taxonomies without the need to go backwards and I actually think it's interesting when you think about this notion that, you know, you can kind of hire a bank of people to fix your data. If they aren't people that have some sort of connection to business objectives, it's going to be a very sterile cleansing. I mean, yes, we want this data to be usable and we want it to be trustworthy, but there's always some amount of artistic license. No, no pun intended mm -hmm. there. But some kind of license that has to be taken or decisions that have to be made in the cleansing process. And if you have someone disconnected from the operation attempting to do that work, there will be implications of the decisions they make in terms of how usable that data is going forward. So you may be just replacing one data quality issue with another. Yeah, and so as we move on to kind of the next part, and we had Kate Vitasek, who this is a really interesting one for me. We were talking about this idea of a standing neutral. Um, you know, how, why it was interesting for me is, you know, the experience that I've had on both sides of the table in delivering and in, um, being a buyer of outsourcing services specifically, where you have these deals that are written and they seem to be win-win at the time that you write the deals. But some of these contracts can be three years, five years, you know, I've had, mm -hmm. um, outsourcing contracts for eight years, you know, speaking with somebody, um, over lunch a couple of weeks ago in a, in a different, like a manufacturing industry, he had contracts for 25 years, you know, the life of essentially of what was being built. Um, and the reality is that what often starts as a win-win very quickly can turn into something different. Um, and it's, it's often difficult to kind of get out of that spiral when you get into a position where the contract's not doing it anymore, um, but mm -hmm. perhaps either both parties or one of the parties aren't willing to do what's needed or what is felt to be needed to get things back on track. No, and it's it's interesting. I So when, when we started reading Kate's paper and preparing for the interview, and then of course listening to it, I actually initially struggled with the concept. I think maybe because for anyone that knows me, you know most of my work is written versus heard. And so to me, the idea of standing neutral, I'm thinking, oh, is this like a James Dean pose? Like, mm. are we supposed to be cooler? Is this an action? Yep. But it's it's not. It's the idea of a standing neutral. It's really kind of like a human prenup, right? And you're sort of saying this contract that our two organizations are putting in place is so complex, which doesn't have to be bad, it's so important. It's so strategic. We need to make sure that we have someone in place to help us if things start to go awry. Because if you wait until things start to go awry, I mean, that's like waiting too long to ask someone what their name is again. Mm -hmm. You get to the point where you almost don't have an alternative to allowing it to fail. Because if things are already in a troubled state, going to them and saying, I think we need mediation. I think we need external support. That's kind of like putting your finger on the scale and potentially even making things worse, despite the fact that you're trying to improve the situation and save the relationship. Yeah, it's, um, you know, the, the concept was, you know, one of the things that you think about having a neutral involved in the governance um, in really almost supporting or helping to support the trust between both parties so things don't get off the rails and, and if there's any sign of things going in that direction mm -hmm. quickly nipping it in the bud um i think for some of the, you know as kate would say in the pod it's not something that you apply to every single thing that you buy but right. for those things that are most important um the you know, most material to the success of your company where the outcomes truly matter it's a small investment you know to essentially protect what could have a big impact on you if things don't go the way you hope that they will do it's also a wonderful reframe of the notion of governance, mm -hmm. you know, because I think when you say governance, automatically people go, ooh, compliance, right? Yep. And then you start thinking about sort of the the police or enforcement aspect of, of procurement. And while some amount of that's necessary, it doesn't do a whole lot to win you friends. Yeah. So I think looking at the right contract or the right supplier relationship with this notion of governance makes it a very productive, positive, proactive kind of activity as opposed to saying, oh, you know, we set out some rule and you didn't follow it and we don't care why, mm -hmm. but you've done the wrong thing. And so now, you know, we need a correction. 
yeah, don't get me started on governance. I could probably do a whole pod <laughs> for the next uh, half an hour or so talking about proactive versus reactive governance. You know, uh, completely agree. Proactive governance has the power to do so much for procurement. Um, but most often we're stuck with reactive governance or the yeah. perception that any government gov- governance, I'm sorry, that we do is reactive by its nature when there is so much opportunity, like I say, getting out ahead of the game um, and using government governance as a strategic tool rather than a reactive one. But then thinking about governance in that light, that's actually an interesting segue to the third part of the month mm-hmm. with Everett Carson from Simpress, where he talked about this very complex balance of you know, on the one hand, not having a mandate to use procurement. In most cases, that's how governance kind of plays out. Yeah. But on the other hand, not having an explicit savings target. So that's a, a very different world if you start thinking about notions of of governance and process compliance. Yeah, I love this conversation. And, and it's it was really interesting when we, we're talking about um, the journey that Everett has been on at Simpress to really transform the procurement organization from one that was a centralized organization to one that's more of a center-led. So centralized being everything at the the center, you know, a single savings target. And center-led being that he has this central organization, but the services that he offers are very different based on the individual business units within his company. Um, And that shift, you know, talking about his CFO, you know, in making the shift from where, you know, the CFO has a savings target on the entirety of the procurement organization, you know, and and you almost don't really care where that number comes from, just that you hit that number, to making the case to the CFO to say, I want to abolish savings targets. And it's like, that's, that's a holy grail for (laughs) so, so much of, I think, so many procurement organizations who are wanting to drive value beyond savings to to convince the organization that the value we can offer is far more than just savings. But the reality of how many of us actually have the opportunity to do that. Um, what was fascinating was how, you know, obviously this the CFO at the beginning, I think was a little bit, mm, I'm not really sure about that one. You know, how am I <laughs> going to measure your ROI if uh, I don't have a savings target to measure you against? Um, and so it kind of dipped his toe in the water. Uh, six months later, under this new model, CFO sees that there's so much more value that's being created and uh, ironically more savings than uh, under the previous model that it became a no-brainer. And it's really, you know, you mentioned the CFO being involved. It's sort of the perfect case example of not just expecting procurement to do what it generally does, but looking at what the organization needs, or in the case of Simpress, they have all these different businesses, each of which has you know, a slightly different geographical footprint or a slightly different cost model Mm -hmm. and saying procurement has this set of knowledge and skills and tools. What is the best thing for them to do based on the revenue targets, the profit margin associated with each of these individual businesses? It's naturally not going to be the same. And that, that really is the goal is making sure we're not just doing what we do. We're doing what the business truly needs us to be from an operational efficiency standpoint. Yeah, I think that what Everett has done and continues to do at Simpress, you know, that's the model for the future of procurement. Mm-hmm. Now, how it is structured uh, organizationally will look different from one company to the other just based on the makeup of the business, you know, whether the business is one that um, that manages by product line, whether it's by um, business function, whether it's by business uh, entity or however it may be, you know, you've got to flex the model based on the, sh- the internal structure. But the, the whole idea, and this is why we're, we're really passionate about, um, you know, the work that we're doing around Procurement Inc., is he is operating as a service-based business. You know, he is taking the needs of each specific stakeholder and building objectives around those needs so that he can fulfill those needs as opposed to seeing the each one of the stakeholder business units as a vehicle for him to be able to hit his savings target. And if you think about it in an entrepreneurial procurement mindset, I would love to have been standing next to Everett five seconds before he walked into the CFO's office mm-hmm. to say, I don't want to do savings anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that takes... It's God's a brave conversation. Takes, it is, a, and, and it takes prep, and it takes yeah. vision, and he has to have a business case ready, but it takes some guts, too. Mm-hmm. 
Um, no, it's, uh, you know, anybody who's thinking about how do I build a stronger business relationship with my stakeholders, make a, uh, increase my impact, I would highly recommend you go and listen to that conversation. Um, and just on that note, um, you know, if you have missed any of the, the uh, episodes that we talked about, you can find them all just at Art of Procurement dot com slash podcast the episodes this month with joe it was episode 301 with kate was 302 and with Everett was 303 so that's where you can find all of the resources for the things that we've we've referenced um the the main topic of the month and we always have one of these every time we do a, a this month in procurement we sort of pick a central topic that we think not only connects to the conversations that we've heard during the month but also connects to a timely and important topic for procurement and i have to admit i'm glad that we're talking about this month's topic but it's not an easy one for mm -hmm. me so the, the topic this month is when you come to the end of a project. Yeah. Now, this is something if you've been a consultant, right, you know that your job is ultimately to render yourself redundant. If procurement is going to become a services business, this is a dynamic that we need to start preparing ourselves to recognize the timeline, recognize the dynamics, manage it. Don't just let it happen. Um, but, but Phil, you've also done a, a lot of consulting work, some of it very recently. Yep. Um, any thoughts that you wanted to share to kind of bring us into this topic about what it's like, how you actively manage the ending phase of a project? Yeah, it's, it's something that came to mind just because we have a couple of things that are, are kind of closing down here from a consulting perspective. And it's, I actually always have a, um, it's, I don't know the right word to use, but it's, you know, it's joyful in a way when you are closing a project. It's not because the project is finished and you're like, oh, I don't have to deal with those guys anymore. That's actually <laughs> the sad part of it because, you know, we always build up really strong relationships with those people that we work with. But it's this idea that, you know, we've come in, we've helped them be self-sustainable. Um, and that's, you know, to some extent, when we think about procurement, going towards more of a self-service model where this, we're helping and enabling stakeholders to do a lot of their own buying, you know, that's, that's where we want to get to. We want to know that we have done our work, we have created the environment, provided the tools, the guidance, all those other things that allow that team to be successful on their own. And nothing gives me more joy than to see that team be able to go and do it. When it comes to the stakeholders, you know, that they're not completely dependent and reliant on procurement to help them do their job. Um, so that's really, it's always the kind of the it's something that we aspire to at the start of the project is how can we get a client, a stakeholder to be in that state where they feel they can still reach out for help when they need it, but they don't need, you know, the handholding that sometimes goes along with the journey to get there. Now, what about, you know, certainly they know they can reach out if yeah. we do a good job kind of winding things down. Now, when you're actually a third party consultant, mm -hmm. right, the contract more or less stipulates that as of this milestone or as of this date, you know, poof, you kind of cease to exist. Yeah. But the fact that procurement is in-house, even if we're functioning as a services business, what would you recommend around when we should reach back out? Just doing kind yeah. of a, a check in, yeah. you know, how often is too often? How often is it healthy? How do you signal the right level of, of interest without being pushy after a project winds down? Yeah, it's a great um, it's a great question. I think the answer is different whether you're an internal procurement organization versus whether you're a third party. And the reason being, you know, if you're a third party consulting firm, that can be taken as you continuing to fish for work. Um, and, you know, I think we all in procurement are kind of wise to that and probably a little bit impatient um, when that happens because you, it's that thing of, you know, what's the motive behind you doing it? And while when you're um, within a procurement organization doing it for your internal clients, you know, that may still be the objective, but there's a little bit of a different dynamic in terms of the perception of that message. Um, so when you're internally, I mean, I always found... Um, Obviously, it depends on the stakeholders. There's no good, okay, you have to do this in every single situation and that, um, um, you know, every single stakeholder that you work with. But I always like to touch base with those who, you know, I'm wanting to maintain a strong relationship with at least every month. You know, even if it's just a quick one, two line email, because you want to still just remain at the front of their mind. Um, you know, whether it's with a little nugget of information that you found out, hey, you know, just... Uh, 
checking in, seeing how things are going, I came across this. I thought you might be interested. You know, always think about how you can add a little bit of value as opposed to it just being, hey, I'm Phil, remember me. If you ever need me, let me know. Um, Because the more value that you can continue to kind of share without there being any expectation of anything in return, the more likely it is that when somebody needs some help, they're going to think about you. And yet as natural as it needs to seem when you make the outreach, as I'm, I'm listening to you talk about, I'm thinking, I, I know myself, I can remember being in these situations, you would finally finish a project, there was always either one or two waiting for you to kick off, and you very quickly switch over to the next effort. Mm-hmm. I do think it's fair to be deliberate, and whether it's putting a note in your calendar yeah. or however you manage your to-dos, you know, it doesn't have to be every every fifth of the month. I'm going to send Susan an email and say, yeah. "Hey, Susan, how are things?" It's the fifth of the month, you know. But if you if you sort of roughly put something in, you know, the second week or the yeah. fourth week, and then let it linger on your to do list a few days or a week, but make sure it happens. It's also unrealistic to expect once you go on to other work that you're going to naturally remember to reach out to people with that kind of a cadence. Yeah, absolutely. Putting it in your calendar, blocking some time. The other tip that I would give is as much as you can kind of batch it. You know, if you've got multiple stakeholders that you're thinking about, I want to make main, make sure and maintain that relationship. Um, just have something in your calendar where for a couple of hours in the once a month, you're going to, you know, send out a few emails all at the same time because batching it makes it a lot easier to do than doing it one at a time. Um, you can do it, you can get it done. It gives you the time to do a little bit of research to find a little nugget to send in their direction. Um, and then you're done for the next month. And you don't okay, think so about now, it again. Last question on this, mm-hmm. right? And now again, I'm thinking of the realities. Yeah. So there's different kinds of stakeholders. Yeah. And there's the stakeholders where you can reach out and say, how are things? And you know, they're either not going to write back or they're going to write back and say, fine. Okay, yeah. transaction complete. Then there are the stakeholders, I'll be kind, that are maybe a little bit needy. Mm -hmm. And there's a risk at reaching back out because they're going to see this as an opportunity to complain Mm -hmm. or an opportunity to try to offload some work or some responsibility back to procurement. How do you manage the back and forth, the staying in touch with stakeholders that are maybe willing to cross a line and have you or have procurement as a whole go beyond the intended role? Yeah, I think in the first, the first thing I would think is maybe it's going to change my the cadence that I reach out to them. Mm. If there's always going to be um, a request that comes in that you know perhaps isn't what um, what our role is. But on the other hand, you know, I would also again it's very dependent on the personality. So I'd leave a um, a listener to make the judgment call on, on each individual. But that's also an opportunity to kind of. Um, share a little bit about what what our role is and what our role isn't. Yeah. Um, because, you know, you can gently respond uh, along the lines of, you know, I'd love to help you, but it's not really something that we're able to support at the moment. Um, and, you know, have like that gentle put down, but that works with some people. It doesn't work <laughs> with other people. You know, if it's a yeah. leader, uh, frankly, I'd be taking that as any opportunity to build a stronger relationship with them and demonstrate, even though they may have a request for something that is a little bit out of what we would do, or perhaps it's a little bit too tactical, that actually they can come to us for help. So I think it it does depend on the level of the person in the organization, how I might respond to that. As with so many other things, procurement would be so much easier if there were no people. I know. And, <laughs> and yet, you know, humans to human is like the heart of what we do. That's what yes, we are. Uh, that's right. You know, technology is a great enabler, but at the end of the day, it's such a people-based function, isn't it? All right, so it's about time to start wrapping up this month in procurement for this month. Um, now, as we do, I am going to be on the road. It's conference season um, coming to us again. It's kind of crazy how quickly around that came. So if you are at any of these events, please drop me a line, you know, send me an email, DM me on LinkedIn, whatever it takes, because I'd love to catch up with you. Um, this week, uh, so March 4th to the 5th, I'm going to be at the Cosmetic Symposium. That is in Orlando, which, uh, you know, one of the good things about living in uh, Florida now is that all these things are really close to me at this time of year. So that's going to be down the road from me uh, for, I think it's Wednesday and Thursday of this week. Um, I'll be then 
heading over to Las Vegas to Ariba Live. That's the 17th and 18th of March. And then back here in my own backyard in Orlando again is BakureCon Indirect. So that's going to be March the 23rd to the 25th. If you're going to be at any of those events, like I say, please let me know. And also just a reminder, uh, when it comes to ProcureCon, we actually, like listeners of Art of Procurement, get 25% uh, if they're on the practitioner side of any ProcureCon event. So you can find the whole list of ProcureCon events, um, the, the code that you can use to get that discount, is all at artofprocurement.com slash procurecon. And hopefully I will get to see you at one of those events. So that's the on-site plans for month. Mm -hmm. uh, as we have you going from warm place to warm place, back to original warm place. <laughs> um, for those of us that are not in warm places, or even if we are, we also have some great podcasts coming up. Um, I know you have Paul Palazzato with Give With. Yeah. Keith Hausman with Globality. Yep. And then finally, we have Rich Ham coming in from Fine Tune, and he's going to talk about one of the more interesting categories of spend, if you've ever done it, the uniforms category. Yeah, it's a nice mix next month. You know, Give With are doing some really interesting things around um, helping, well, helping organizations, not just procurement, procurement being a facilitator, but helping organizations really invest back into the communities um, and the social causes that are important to them. Um, Globality is a fascinating company who are looking at um, really setting up self-service buying for stakeholders, but not, you know, how you may consider it as being the nuts and bolts, you know, the uh, commodity items, but mm. for specific um, complex services. So something that we need as procurement professionals really to keep our eyes open, but that we need to be leveraging and we need to figure out a way as we talk about on the podcast all the time, you know, how do we make our role be able to take advantage of, of technology like this rather than be Absolutely. negatively impacted by it. And then uh, talking to Rich and the uniforms category, we like to have specific category shows uh, every once in a while. And uniforms is one of those categories that if you've never bought it, you think it's, oh, you know, what can be more uh, difficult than buying a few shirts? Um, you know, <laughs> and once, you're so wrong. You're so yeah, wrong. Once you buy it, it's like, oh, <laughs> that's probably the most personal. When you think about yeah. categories that are personal to people, corporate travel, um, mm -hmm. maybe catering and uniforms are up there at the top. So you don't want to put a step wrong because if you do, your CEO is going to know about it. So that's what we have coming up next month. I want to thank everybody for listening into this month in procurement. Um, also, I want to just encourage you always reach out to us with questions or comments. You can connect with both Kelly and I on LinkedIn, um, but also through email, through um, responding to the newsletter that we send out. Anyway, you know, there's, there's a million and one ways for you to get in touch. So we always love to hear from you. Um, but until next month, Kelly, I want to thank you again for joining me. Always glad to be here. All right, have a great month, everybody, and I'll talk to you soon. Hi there. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. You can check out all of our back catalog at artofprocurement.com slash podcast, where you can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure that you never miss an episode. And if you found value in today's show, I'd love if you would tell a peer or perhaps go and rate and review by going to artofprocurement.com slash review. Word of mouth really is the best way to help the podcast grow. And if you're able to do either one of those things, I would truly appreciate it. 